Hello, and welcome to this session, The Unwanted and Unloved Invasive Insects That Should Be on Your Radar. I want to thank the Planning Committee for recognizing the relevance and the importance of this topic and the opportunity to share some information with you and hopefully encourage you to help join what I have termed the Invasive Species Army. I wanted to share with you some objectives that I have for this session, which I hope aligns with the information that you are looking for. We'll begin with the introduction and the pest clause, followed by the identifying Ohio's top five unwanted, at least in my eyes. We'll talk about each of those insects, how to monitor, report, and finally, information on management. The last objective is kind of a call to action to hopefully encourage you to become more involved. Whenever I do a talk on invasive species, I try to begin each program with some basic information, terminology, and a fun fact to get people thinking, followed by a little disclaimer, the plant clause. It is truly important to define the word native. If we were together in the same room, I would ask you to shout out some answers. And what the heck? We aren't physically together, but yell out your definition, the words that you would use to describe the term native. Usually people respond by saying something that's been there for a very long time. Oppositely, when we talk about non-native, people describe that as something that maybe has been introduced either on purpose or accidentally. And finally, the term invasive. If something is invasive, it has to cause some sort of harm. This could be environmentally, ecologically, economically. Often it outcompetes or maybe kills another species along the way. It's important to remember that if something is termed invasive, it has to be non-native. A native species cannot be invasive. Rather, we should refer to it as aggressive. And finally, I ask people to think about, do you think invasive species increases or decreases biodiversity? We could do a show of hands, but people's initial answer usually is decreases. And I can't disagree, but ultimately in the beginning, there is actually an increase, right? A brand new species. Here is the start of the pest clause. What is presented today is the latest and greatest on the, this date and at this time. We could end this presentation and I could check my email and there would be some change or some new news about an invasive species. Always try to stay up to date on any changes or updates that may occur with these invasive species. This could be by checking reliable social media sites or websites. You could sign up for our Ohio Buckeye Yard and Garden Line, which is timely seasonal alerts or articles about what's happening horticulturally. The website can be found at bygl.osu.edu, and you can visit the site and sign up for Beagle email alerts when new postings are made. So let's get started talking about these unwanted and unloved invasive insect pests. As you can see, the top five that I have chosen include the gypsy moth, the Asian longhorn beetle, the viburnum leaf beetle, the spotted lanternfly, and hemlock woolly adelgid. Let's dig a little deeper. So Linematra dispar, is um, the scientific name of what was formerly known as the gypsy moth and currently has no recognized common name. 
these are three photos, um, obviously, um, from the 1800s. This insect was introduced um, on purpose to our country uh, by this individual um, in the Massachusetts area. The insect escaped uh, where he was working with that. He told authorities about it, um, and they kind of watched the population, monitor, didn't think it was really going to be an issue. And then um, several years later, there was an outbreak, and they worked really hard on eradication efforts. And the photo on the far right, if you look really closely, um, are individuals up in the tree doing early eradication efforts by removing egg masses. Unfortunately, um, those efforts uh, were not successful, and we've had to live with the gypsy moth ever since. So let's begin uh, by talking about the egg mass stage. And this, of course, is the stage of the insect um, in this particular case that the insect spends most of its time. It overwinters in this stage. Um, and so right now, if you were to go look for gypsy moths, this is what you would be looking for. And in the spring, at the same time that we um, notice red buds first beginning to bloom, that should be kind of the light bulb moment that, okay, if gypsy moth is here, those egg masses um, or from those egg masses are caterpillars that will begin to hatch. And so we use something called growing degree days. And if you're familiar with that, um, the red buds first bloom growing degree day unit is 191. And the egg mass or gypsy moth egg hatch is at 192. So correlated very closely. And so that's what we would see happening um, at that time in the spring. And so these little small black um, hairy caterpillars would emerge from that egg mass. And to give you kind of a, a size, um, I love this photo uh, with the dime to, to show you how small they are and often how overlooked they are in this stage. It's not until the caterpillars get much larger um, and at this point are eating machines, right, and can defoliate um, large mature trees and become very problematic um, because the caterpillars are climbing everywhere. Um, as those caterpillars eat, that's um, raining frass. And so even on a beautiful sunny day, um, you could hear what sounds like rain and it's actually the frass falling from above. So once the caterpillars um, are finished feeding, they will pupate um, where then adults will emerge. And so the photo here is a female. Um, she's laying her egg mass. Uh, the females and males look slightly different. Uh, the females are more of a white to off-white and tend to be a little bit larger. The males are um, more brown, have very feather-like antenna. Uh, the males will fly where the females really don't. And so she gives off a pheromone and the male comes to find her, they mate, and then she lays eggs like she's doing in this photo to the left. And then we've got the egg masses again that are there. We'll spend all the um, remaining part of summer into fall and over winter until they um, hatch the following year. And that cycle continues. Now, if we look at management um, options, and I've put on the slide integrated pest management because there's all sorts of things in a toolbox that we need to rely on or work with when we uh, manage all insects, uh, but specifically today we're talking about invasive species. And so monitoring, which um, is kind of illustrated here with the binoculars, and really just getting out into the environment and looking. And so this can be specific um, while you're, you know, I'm monitoring for gypsy moth, or while you're out there um, doing regular things. So, you know, managing landscapes, um, you know, you're out in your community, uh, watching and looking uh, for these invasive insects is really important. The Ohio Department of Agriculture uses traps through much of Ohio. Um, those traps have a pheromone inside them. 
And so the males are attracted, they can open up those traps and it can give them an indication of what populations are doing. And so that's the, the photo on the far bottom left. When we talk about integrated pest management, there are some biological controls that um, are working in our favor for the gypsy moth. Um, that includes um, what we're seeing here are these dead caterpillars that are hanging down, um, Entomophaga myomyga, which is a fungus. There's also a virus that uh, will attack the caterpillars and kill them. And of course, there are some insects and some birds, um, some mice um, will also feed, um, especially on the egg masses over the winter. Um, another integrated pest management opportunity, especially geared towards monitoring, um, would be the burlap that you see um, on the, the top of the screen towards the right. And so as those caterpillars get larger, um, they actually have a change in behavior that they primarily feed um, during the evening and take cover during the day. And so you're, you're uh, providing a cover for them. And so what people do is they'll go out and lift up that burlap and they'll see and maybe collect, remove caterpillars. And it's really not a full-blown management, um, but it is more of a monitoring technique. Um, and it does raise awareness in communities. Um, you can put those caterpillars, you know, in that bucket, um, you can smash them, you can do whatever you want to dispose of them and reduce populations. Of course, there are um, labeled pesticides that can be used both by a homeowner, uh, by a municipality, um, and by a certified applicator. And so those would be done on individual trees in landscapes and communities. Uh, but the also, also in Ohio, the Ohio Department of Agriculture has a cooperative or a collaborative uh, gypsy moth treatment program uh, where they do some aerial applications, both of a, an organic insecticide um, as well as a mating disruption. And so those are typically in areas where the insect is very widespread um, and, and has to be a minimum of 50 acres. And so in areas where, I'm going to forward the slide here, in the red, which is considered the suppression zone, um, though you could make an application to the state if you live in an area that has a large number of gypsy moths. And so it's a cost share. There are minimum requirements that have to be met for that block. And those are all spelled out very nicely on the Ohio Department of Agriculture's website. There is a quarantine in place. And so the red counties are quarantined, the gray counties are not. And so there are, um, things that you can't do or bring from a, a red quarantine county into a um, gray non-quarantine county. And the purpose of that quarantine is to reduce the, the spread of the insect through artificial movement. Our next insect that we're gonna talk about is the hemlock woolly adelgid. The hemlock woolly adelgid um, is, has a very unique life cycle. Um, all of the, the insects are female. They develop um, parthenogenetically um, or asexually. There are six stages of development, including an egg, four nymphal instars, and then the adult. There are two overlapping generations per year. It's kind of illustrated here on this drawing. Um, the overwintering generation or the cystins is present from early summer through mid spring. And then the spring generation or the progerians is uh, presented from, or, or is present, I'm sorry, from early spring through midsummer. These are two different maps for you to take a look at. One is um, a larger map, um, kind of showing you an updated uh, picture of where this insect is across North America. And then the map to the right is just Ohio and the red counties are quarantine counties where we know um, there are hemlock woolly adelgid uh, populations. 
I had mentioned the Buckeye Yard and Garden line before um, as a great resource to kind of stay up to date um, on changes that occur with invasive species along with other um, horticulture happenings. Um, but you can see here there was a post um, earlier this year when they had a new find in Kent, Ohio. And so often there's photos along with uh, printed information about those updates. And online, you can find a hemlock woolly adelgid uh, managing a non-native invasive pest in Ohio that includes additional information about life cycle, biology, and different types of management. When we go into those management options, obviously scouting is going to be a reoccurring theme that you hear throughout this presentation. So looking um, typically on the undersides of the branches of the hemlock, um, and you would see these cotton ball like um, material with the insects inside that. Um, there have been uh, releases of insects, so as a biological control to try to keep populations in check, along with, of course, chemical treatments um, to reduce populations of the insect. Our next insect is one that's um, fairly new. Um, it's the spotted lanternfly. We're going to take a look at this diagram that's been provided by Penn State Extension, um, highlighting the life cycle of the insect kind of in this illustration. And you'll see, let's start at um, nine o'clock with the adults, uh, which we would have just um, kind of finished up that activity late summer into fall uh, when we have a good hard frost or freeze. Uh, the adults are killed. Um, but what happens prior to that is they lay an egg mass or the female lays an egg mass uh, that includes the future generation. And so it spends all um, the remaining fall into winter and early spring as an egg. Uh, we see the first um, hatch of the instar or the nymph um, typically in May into June. Um, it goes through four instars or stages in that nymph form. The first three are, are black with white spots, followed by uh, the fourth instar that has, again, the black, white, and then red is added in um, to its body. Um, at that stage, they will go from the fourth instar nymph to the adult, uh, one generation per year. Um, all of the stages, the nymphs and the adults will feed. Uh, they are plant hoppers, so they're using piercing sucking mouth parts to cause damage um, as they feed. Here's some actual photos, uh, which I think are always really helpful. Um, the first photo on the top left hand side is an adult, um, very showy, very beautiful. Um, and often this is the stage of the insect that uh, we get the most calls or reports um, or findings about because they're the easiest just because of, of the size. Those adults, um, especially obviously the female will lay eggs and I wanted to illustrate what happens to the egg mass throughout the season or over the winter and so when the egg mass is laid and, and this photo is really good because it has you'll see if you can see where my pointer is uh, the eggs are laid in rows or people have described them as chains and often she will cover up that those eggs uh, with this kind of waxy substance um, when she covers them initially but it almost kind of dries and turns to kind of like a mud like substance and so you can see this is um, early after she laid the egg and then the the photo to the far right whoops let me slide back here for just a second didn't mean to there we go so if we go back to this photo um, in the top right hand corner you can see that covering has kind of cracked or dried a bit um, it's the same egg mass as you can see these exposed eggs here but there are lots of eggs underneath and typically there are between 30 to 50 eggs in one mass from those egg masses like i had described earlier we start to see the first through third instars that are white or black with the white spots, followed by the fourth instar, uh, which has got the red addition to it. And then from this stage, it's going to turn into the adult and 
continue that life cycle. What's also really important when we talk about uh, spotted lanternfly is the host. And so the two favorite hosts are the tree of heaven or Alanthus and um, grapes, both um, wild grapevines and those that um, are grown in vineyards. And so there can be a lot of other hosts. Um, currently, the the listing of observed host plants is um, over a hundred. Um, usually, the nymphs have a much wider host range than the adults. Uh, but we're encouraging people to monitor for the insect um, on their two favorite, which is the Atlantis tree of heaven and the grapes. So once you get um, you know, educated and you learn more about what to look for, um, you know, we hope that you're out there looking for this insect. And of course, when we see people out there looking, um, you know, you may stumble upon another insect and you think, gosh, is that spotted lanternfly or not? And we really encourage you if you suspect that it is that may just look like a little bit like it, you know, you're not sure, we would rather have you submit a photo or the actual sample. Uh, we would rather have 100 people report something that really isn't spotted lanternfly than miss a report of something that truly is. And so Virginia Cooperative Extension has two of my favorite uh, resources are handouts. One is possible spotted lanternfly adult lookalikes, and then also spotted lanternfly egg mass lookalikes. And so both of those are readily available and you can pull those down, print them out. Uh, we've had people laminate them so they hold up a little bit better out in the field, but um, those are ones that people sometimes would maybe get confused with the actual spotted lanternfly. I did wanna show you just real quickly, um, this is a current map um, of where we know spotted lanternfly is and where it's been detected. And there are two things that I wanna point out just real quickly is the blue color, uh, those are reproducing populations or growing infestations. Uh, there are some red lines, and those red lines indicate quarantines. Uh, you will notice that Ohio has two counties, um, Jefferson County here and Cuyahoga County here. Um, since this update on October the 19th, um, those two counties have been quarantined by the Ohio Department of Agriculture. And so the next map that comes out will have red lines um, around both of those counties. The other thing that I want to point out, and I'm uh, my arrow is on one of those right now, is a purple dot. And those are individual finds of the spotted lanternfly, but there was no infestation present. And what that means is there was a hitchhiker. And so maybe somebody visited an area and brought one back um, or you know, through um, commercial transportation, you know, somebody found an insect. Um, and so they reported a single um, spotted lanternfly, um, usually in the adult stage. And after doing some survey work, they found no other um, insects um, in no other stages. And so it was obviously they're going to keep an eye on those um, areas just to make sure they didn't miss anything. Um, but hopefully the good news is that it was just a single um, specimen and not a reproducing population. So let's talk um, about the integrated pest management. And this one is a little bit different in that you can see that there are two binoculars. Uh, one, we're encouraging to, to look for the actual insect itself, uh, but we're also encouraging you to look at and watch those two favorite host plants, and specifically Alanthus or Tree of Heaven. Um, it is actually an invasive plant, and so uh, you can actually report that, and we'll talk about reporting in just a bit. So keeping track of where you're seeing these monitoring, um, the one thing is you can identify the spot or the the Alanthus tree and revisit that throughout the season. Um, and each time you look for it, if you actually don't find anything, you can do a negative report that will be explained in just a bit. 
Uh, right now in Ohio, the only pesticides that are really being used or recommended right now are through the Ohio Department of Agriculture and the USDA as ways to try to eradicate, eliminate, or at least reduce populations in both Jefferson and Cuyahoga counties. Um, right now, we are not at a point where homeowners, um, vineyard owners, um, commercial arborists should be treating for spotted lanternfly uh, because those projects are being handled by the Department of Agriculture. All right, on to the next, oh, which is the Asian longhorn beetle. And let's take a quick look at its life cycle. Again, another insect uh, with a single generation per year. Um, we can start out um, by right now, um, they're actually in the larval stage in the tree. And so you can see here where they've um, have bored into the tree and are feeding inside the tree, um, usually um, in the center of the tree or the sapwood or heartwood. They will continue um, you know, to feed. They slow down a little bit over the winter as temperatures um, get cold. Um, as spring happens, they kind of get going again. They will pupate inside the tree, which we see down here on the bottom right hand side. Um, and then out from the tree, they will um, emerge as um, adults. And so those adults will feed and mate. Um, they will lay eggs on the tree. And I'll show you what that looks like specifically. Um, and then the cycle begins. Uh, this is another one that the adult uh, will not overwinter. It doesn't withstand our cold temperatures. And so it is overwintering as larvae inside the tree. Um, and that's what the season, obviously, that we're going into. So right now, um, you know, this fall, um, late summer, there were adult activity. Uh, the adult female will chew these little pits where she lays an individual egg. Um, that egg hatches. Um, it feeds underneath the bark in the phloem for a little bit and then goes into the xylem and the heartwood of the tree. And that's when we see these large larvae. They're going to be in the center of the tree. Uh, so their feeding is a little bit different than emerald ash borer, who were strictly phloem feeders or primarily phloem feeders. Um, and they were feeding right underneath the bark. Um, and so they will actually feed and disrupt that the wood that makes um, limbs kind of weak and will break. And so that's one thing to be on the lookout for. Um, so if you have a branch that comes down, um, don't think, well, it's probably just, you know, wind or the storm, you know, take a look in there to see if what the actual cause was. Um, the larvae then pupate. So we can see that here in the tree. Um, changes into an adult um, or transforms into an adult and then emerges from um, that, that um, the tree in this perfectly round hole that you can stick a number two pencil in. When we talk about growing degree days, this is one that we've got some, some data around. And so at 884 growing degree days, the fuzzy dutia is in full bloom. This is one of the shrubs. And at 887, the first ALB adult emergence occurs. And that continues all the way through about uh, 1,887 is when we see half of ALB adult emergence. And so you can see it's a, a pretty um, wide range uh, of when those insects are beginning to emerge. And so uh, a large window to be on the lookout for in the summer uh, for the beetles. Why this pest is a huge concern is its wide host range. Uh, very good hosts include the maples. Um, they will also feed on the horse chestnuts and buckeyes, which are in the Ascula species. Um, they like elms and willows. And then you can see here this laundry list of other hosts. And so, you know, just think of your own landscape or landscapes that you maintain. Um, there probably aren't very many that don't have at least one potential host tree for the Asian longhorn beetle. USDA has a great website. And so you can click on um, the four states that have current populations or infestations of ALB. There is a larger map and um, 
you can see here, the green are successful eradication. So when you see the green dots, those are all good. Um, the red dots, um, I wouldn't say they're necessarily bad, but they are current eradication efforts, right? And so those are ongoing efforts. And you can see here in Ohio, our um, infestation is in um, outside of Cincinnati and Claremont County. And if we look closer to the map on the right hand side, um, this is the, the red line is the quarantined area uh, where eradication efforts continue. And then we have two smaller areas that are outlined in blue and that's where eradication has been successful. Our next insect is the viburnum leaf beetle and the viburnum leaf beetle causes um, the foliage to disappear as it's eaten by both the larval stage and the adult stage. And so this insect actually overwinters in eggs along the stems, which are typically on the newest growth. And so those eggs hatch into larvae in the spring and they begin feeding. Uh, when the larvae are done feeding, they will drop down um, underneath the plant, they will pupate and then emerge as adults, and those adults then will come back up on the plant um, and continue to feed. We have a great fact sheet um, on Ohio Line about viburnum leaf beetle, and of course, uh, many updates on our Buckeye Yard and Garden Line. When we talk about integrated pest management, we're obviously looking for this insect, um, so monitoring in that way. Uh, we may be choosing uh, viburnums to add to landscapes uh, based on susceptibility or tolerance to viburnum leaf beetle. And in that fact sheet, it kind of has a host preference. And so if you are monitoring, um, for that the American uh, cranberry and the European cranberry viburnum are very um, are, are um, some of its favorite. Um, and so those are, are two that you would look for um, and, and watch pretty carefully. Additionally, um, you can prune and remove those egg laying sites. And so pruning those off and destroying them, um, not just letting them sit on the ground, uh, but getting them off site uh, will help reduce populations. And of course, there are our insecticide treatments. You do have to be cautious with insecticide treatments um, and beware of when you're making those applications and when the um, viburnums are in bloom because it can impact pollinators such as bees. All right, so you have been, um, you know, tasked with getting to be more familiar with the insects. Um, know that you can report all of those invasive species using our Great Lakes Early Detection app. And if you see here, uh, this red circle actually should be, uh, I wanted to kind of highlight these negative surveys uh, because if you're looking at areas, especially for spotted lanternfly and it's not there, you can make a negative survey. So we know at least people are out there looking. Um, but this app is a great app. It includes all invasive species you can choose. So here we've got um, insects that we would click on. Some of the photos um, are actually, I took from a different presentation that I was doing on invasive plants, uh, but you can click on specific um, species. There are images um, of that species. Additionally, you will notice there's some information. Um, so it's actually a good learning tool. And then reporting, you'll see that uh, right there. And we're using the early detection and distribution mapping system. So you'll log into that and then you will take a photo. Um, it'll take your GPS coordinates. They will go into an upload queue. And so whenever you have reliable uh, Wi-Fi, you can go ahead and upload all those reports. And once confirmed, they become a red dot. Now, I hope that the information doesn't have you really depressed or tired and that you're actually kind of excited um, or as excited as you can be about invasives. Um, and a drum, drum roll here, I added one more to my list. Uh, this is the Asian giant hornet, which is not in Ohio. Um, it's also known as the murder hornet. Um, this is out, um, an issue in the state of Washington. 
But I do have to say the Ohio Department of Agriculture has a great reporting website. And so if you suspect that you something that looks like the Asian giant hornet. Um, if you can take a photo or collect a specimen and then report it on their website, um, they're also keeping track of the lookalikes. And so um, check out their website for additional information. I hope that uh, this presentation has been helpful for you and that you are taking some information away. If you have any additional questions um, or need some outreach materials, um, especially as it relates to the spotted lanternfly as we're truly trying to raise awareness in Ohio, uh, please take a look and give me a call or send me an email and I can get those materials to you. Thanks so much.